Hello. Happy Sunday. Good morning. How are you? Fantastic. It's so good to see all of you this morning. Go ahead and turn to those around you and uh, welcome them to the church as well, and we'll keep going in just a little bit.
We just thank you for that so much this morning. And we thank you for your love. As undeserving as we are of it, God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you've already gone ahead and ordered our steps, God, that you've pulled us out of whatever we're going through right now, God. You've already seen the end, Father, and we, we thank you for that. God, we thank you for just being who you are loving us for who we are, as we are, God. We just thank you for that this morning. It's your name I pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat.
Morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Welcome to Cokesbury. My name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here. And if this is your first time with us, we're glad that you guys are here. We're going to dismiss our kids. Uh, everybody's going to go out the back, K through four, fifth and sixth grade. If you are new and you're not aware of what's going on, we like to have kids here to worship together. And then we send them out. They're going to a great team of staff and volunteers that are going to share a story of Jesus with them. And uh, you're always free to go with them if you'd like to check that out. One of the things I love about this moment is they're, if you ask them after church what they learned, they're going to be able to tell you. Um, as we've got a really great team of folks who are going to share the love of Christ with them. While they're making their way out of the room, I want to remind you guys that Holy Week does start next Sunday, believe it or not. Um, and then we've got a week full of activities and uh, service opportunities for you guys to engage in that, it starts next Sunday over in traditional worship with their Easter music. If you grew up in a more traditional background, there may be during the holiday season that kind of draw to want to experience that. It's going to be awesome. You can go check that out um, next weekend. Then on Holy Thursday, we'll have come and go communion on the traditional campus. Good Friday, there are two opportunities. We have a lunchtime uh, service, and then we'll come gather together that night for a service, and then we start sunrise on Easter Sunday and, and go throughout the morning. Uh, lots of opportunities. I tell you that not to say, hey, you got to come to everything. But what I do want you to do is pick one or two things and come engage because this is a huge week in the life of the church. It's the kind of the penultimate moment of our faith that we get to gather together and celebrate. And so I want you guys to take advantage of that. I think it'll do you good um, and it'll get you ready for Easter Sunday. So I hope that you guys will help us out there. We are also starting Easter Sunday, adding a third service. Our 10 o'clock service is just packed and we're trying to make more room. So we'll start 9, 10, 15, 11, 30, starting on Easter as we move into the summer. And so some of you guys will come to church on time and it'll be great, right? Um, but that'll give you an extra 15 minutes. We are gonna back up to 11, 30 to, to let that um, nine and 10 o'clock crowd navigate the parking lot and hopefully it'll make it easier on you guys getting in as well. One of the things that we do need help with starting on Easter is we need greeters. And um, this is not for the bitter angry people. Um, this is just for the people who can make their smile muscles and their face work. Uh, it's a very easy job, y'all. And listen, in all seriousness, uh, it helps us put our best foot forward. We have lots of folks who are checking us out um, and, and are um, visiting with us, and it, it helps us um, reach out to them. Just it's simply smiling, telling somebody good morning. It's an easy job. If it's something that you'd like to do to take your next step to try out serving in our community, if you'll see Jill Stucky out in guest services, she'll get you coached up and uh, get you assigned to the service that you want to be a part of, and she will get all the information you need to be able to do that. So I hope you guys will help us out. And we had a number of people step up in the early, uh, other service to do this, and we need a little help from you guys as well. We're going to receive our morning offering now, and um, I just want to say thanks as one of your leaders. Um, a lot of us have been together for a long time, and your generosity is, is just overwhelming. It's impressive, and I'm really grateful because the way that we pool our resources together is what enables us every single day of the week to impact lives. And if you've been around our church very long at all, you have figured out pretty quick that God is moving in very powerful ways, um, not just on the weekends, but every single day of the week, we are impacting our community and um, we can't do that without you. And so I just want you to hear me say thanks for that. We don't ever take it for granted. There's a number of way, ways you guys can give. We're gonna pass the baskets uh, in just a few moments, but if you give online or you drop it in the box or however it is that you give, I really, really appreciate that. So I've got some friends who are gonna help us receive the offering. I'm gonna ask them to come on up. And while they're doing that, if you would join me in just a moment of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, I give you thanks for the gift of this day. It's good to be able to gather together, whether we're sitting here on campus or we are sitting on our couch and we logged in and we're part of our online community. It's just good to be able to stop long enough to, to just offer some songs, to hear your word broken open, to think about things that are way beyond what we're facing just here in the moment of each day. God, I pray that as we receive this morning's offering that you'll do what you do best, that you'll take our gifts, that you'll multiply them, and that over the next seven days, you will 
direct them to the lives that need it the most, that we'll make not just an impact for someone's better, but that we might even be able to change their forever. Lord, as Mark comes in just a few moments to open up your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be thick in this room, that you'll open up our hearts and our minds, that by the time we're through, we'll know for sure that we have stood on holy ground in your presence. For it's in the name of the resurrected Jesus that we pray, amen. How are you guys this morning? Good? So my name is Mark Beebe, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. I work, do a lot of work with um, recovery ministries. Got to tell you, it's not every day you have an interpreter at a church that can actually dance. Amen? <laughs> How about that? So um, glad you're here. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, you put us in a good place. This good place is right here. I know you're going to love us and talk to us and teach us about you. I know that we're going to be challenged. I know that we're going to be hopefully set free from ourselves, at least for a little bit. 
In your sweet name, amen. So people are joining us online. Say good morning to them. And uh, we're going to get into the story here, kind of going along the lines of Jesus loves me even when I'm a mess. We're going to see the story here, how it works out, you know, what the me- what's causing the mess. And so um, one of the things that tends to cause a mess is this whole conversation about power. Like, um, I think that, uh, I think that my daughter and her husband might have made a somewhat fatal mistake when they decided they were going to take their three kids to Pigeon Forge for spring break. And they were going to stay in two rooms. And you're like, I, I don't think that is enough. Like, and the reason, the reason that that's true is their oldest child has decided that he, he has always slept in a bed by himself, always been in a room by himself. And so he has no... He has no um, history of any kind of anybody sleeping with him. Every time he and his brother have tried to sleep together, it's just freaking bedlam. So they're like, it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. Well, at our house, it was one night. It was Sunday night. And I'm like, it just, it was a, to say it was a disaster is an understatement. Like, I'm like, so when they get up, I'm like, how did everybody sleep last night? The parents, there's virtually no talking. You know, my grandkids, great, great, pop, pop. It's like they're, they're wide awake. Parents dragging down. They're like, well, my daughter's like, well, I had to sleep with Holden. And Robert had to sleep with Aiden. I'm like, that tells me everything I need to know. And they're like, you know, never again, Dad. Well, see, like the thing is, the oldest, he only knows that he's sleep, he slept by himself. So anytime anybody else gets involved, it's just like, it ain't great. You know what I mean? Like, we had that experience when we tried to watch him a couple weekends ago. Like, I find him like, if you can't, if you can't sleep in the same room, then I'm going to put one of you out in the hallway up to sleep there. What you, he goes, how are you going to put my bed out in the hallway? I'm like, you're not going to have a bed slick. That's the way that's going to work. But he was like, he got wide-eyed like, what? We always sleep in a bed. So, I mean, like, it's just a thing. Like, I would, no, I would probably not recommend Pigeon Forge, probably not recommend that. Deal. They went to this. They went to that water park, Adelia, over there, you know. So the one good thing was the wave, the, uh, wave pool. They loved that, and they loved the surfing thing. At least two of them did. And, I mean, when my daughter was over, our daughter was over and her husband, they're, they're the one, they have the three kids, you know, so they're the first ones that have kids. And so we get to like have fun with them at their expense, probably. And we're like, you have one child, you're oldest, so we kind of raised a psychotic child, we think that, but you know, don't ask us. So my daughter finally says to me, she, when they were over there, like, daddy, I mean, like, she goes, daddy, I mean, is it a problem that holding their middle son she goes, I think no matter like what you say to him and how you discipline him, he just takes it in stride and he just, I don't really think he cares. I'm like, yeah, honestly, he really doesn't. I'm just telling you, honey. And I'm like, and your daughter watching this come, it's just going to be worse. You know, it's just going to be worse. Like he, um, when they were at our house, when they were at their house, I mean, it was like a Sunday morning that happened. So Carol calls me in there and goes, you may want to come and maybe you want to come and like look at this for a minute. I'm like, you, you know when they say that, there's no way they did something lovely, right? There's no way. So I go in the closet. He has this sort of like drawings everywhere. I'm like, first of all, I'm like, Holden, wh- where did you get this crayon? Well, I mean, I borrowed it from my mommy's drawer and I mean, it's like, yeah, it was in your mommy's drawer for a reason. So I'm like immediately trying to figure out what I got to do to get one of those magic erasers. You know, like, I'm like, I'm going to die when his parents get home because they were on this trip. And so I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm like, well, hold on. I mean, like, you know, I mean, man, baby, I mean, like, we, you really should, we really can't be drawn on walls. 
he looks at me with this, this is him. He looks up, I, I love you, Pop Pop. <laughs> and you're like, that is not gonna save you there, Slick. It's not gonna do it because I have seen all this before. I've seen this movie before. You know, so it, it's like, I really think my daughter's right. I don't think, I don't think kid number two really cares. And like kid number three, the, the golden child, the daughter, it's just gonna be bad because she already knows she's the golden child. And just think of that going forward. So not pretty. But I think um, if you translate sort of who's the favorite into a conversation, it takes me like to, to where like there were six kids in my family. And so somewhere along the way, my mother buys this massive Pontiac station wagon, like, you know, the one with the, um, the, one with the wood on it, you know that wood stuff? And um, she, she um, it barely fit in the garage. That's how big it was. Power windows all over the place. And so she got, it was the first car we ever had that had air conditioning. My dad drove to work and back every day to downtown Cincinnati and no AC. He was the one wearing a, you know, a suit and a tie and all that, no AC. My mother gets this air conditioned car. It was the first time I'd ever seen an air conditioned car. And so I'm like, I mean, how, I'm like, look at my dad going, how come, mom, how come mom gets the air conditioned car? My dad looks at me and he goes, first of all, dumb question. Second of all, ask your mother. Okay. So she gets this air conditioned car and I think the coolest thing about this car was, it wasn't the question normally kids are gonna ask is what? Who gets to ride shotgun, right? Who gets to ride shotgun? Well, in this car, you didn't want shotgun. In this car, it had a seat in the back, the, old, the, the far rear seat, it was so cool. It was like on, being on Southwest Airlines. I mean, back in the, you remember Southwest Airlines back in the day when you would get on the plane and then one of the very first rows, it, the seats faced each other. You remember that? You're like, no, I never saw it. Really, it was true. I'm telling you, it's a true story. It happened. You get on there and like you could can, you can face each other. Well, in this car, in this station wagon, the rear seat faced backwards. We loved it, man. It was just cool. We loved it because we could see wherever we had come from. That was just cool. So we fought for that seat. And it's like, that's unusual because that would seem to be the last place you would ever really want to fight for. The shotgun thing is what you're looking for. And when you get into this story with Jesus today, I mean, that's really the question that's being asked up front is who gets to ride shotgun? Like Jesus, who gets to ride shotgun? Like, can we ride shotgun? So you have, you have this story where you have this mom of these two boys. Some people suggest they were like pretty young. Maybe they're 14 years old, I don't know. but that the mom still would kind of be speaking for them, even though those were his Jesus followers. And I don't know if that's true about their, their, their age or not, but even though they were Jesus followers, you, have, you do have the mom speaking for them in this story. And the question is really, who gets to ride shotgun? So the larger question is, does Jesus love me even when I'm a mess? Because this conversation we're about to get into in this piece of scripture, like, man, these dudes are just a mess. They're like a bona fide mess. They really are. They're a, they're a wreck. They like got all kinds of priority issues. They got all kind of power issues. They got all kind of pride issues. They got lots of stuff going on. So the story goes like this. When the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of thunder, came to Jesus with her sons, she knelt respectfully to ask this favor. What's your request, Jesus asked. She said, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. In other words, would you please let my sons sit Shotgun. Jesus answered them by saying, you don't know what you're asking for. 
Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm that I am about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. Jesus says to them, you will indeed, indeed drink from my bitter cup. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the other 10 disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were, I love this word, indignant, right? Indignant, put out, mad, torqued, whatever, indignant. But Jesus called them together and said this, you know that the rulers in this world lorded over people and officials flaunt their authority or their, where they are in the seating chart or whatever over those who are under them. But among you, it's gonna be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you is gonna have to be your servant. Imagine how top end that is, how reverse that is. He's gonna have to be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom, a ransom for many. It's Matthew 20, beginning with verse 20 through 28. So, man, just look for a second at what a mess these guys are. Like, they, they have it wrong from the jump. They're asking one question. Jesus has them in this completely different place. They have one set of values, of what they think is important, what they think status is, right? Jesus says, look, man, his way of status is way over here. They have one set of expectations. Jesus is way over there. The story can't be more reversed for them. The story for Jesus is unbelievably consistent. He's been saying the same thing about serving and loving people and sacrificing for a long time. They, I think these guys walked away from this conversation that we're seeing here, thoroughly confused probably in disagreement, not really believing what he said, because when you get all the way to the end of the story, next week, we're gonna have Palm Sunday. You get into that story, or the story of the week of the Passion, Jesus, the, the story of Jesus' death, every single story in the Passion is end over end, isn't it? Every single story is full of surprises. Every single story takes the understanding of the word power and turns it into sacrifice. Takes the understanding which is unusual of the word power and turns it into service. These guys are a mess, they're a mess. And the thing about us is, we, and a lot of times, we kinda wanna think, we kinda wanna think the same way, we, we're, we're a mess. What, what causes all of us that mess? The disciples and us, what, what causes that? I think two things always cause that mess of, of, for lack of a better word, status. Where do I fit in the pecking order? How do, I, how do I know myself in this kingdom of God that is so different from the way I would normally know and live my life? Because what is lifted up is success. What is lifted up is status. What is lifted up is power. What is lifted up is fame. And you're like, man, and as the story goes forward with Jesus, none of that is gonna be that story. The story of Jesus is gonna, is gonna, it looks like it's gonna end in Jerusalem on a cross with Jesus almost naked in public, nailed to that cross, and in the end of that story, he loved the world so much that he dies for it. 
man, we're so different from his expectation of us and we're so different from this trying to join in that story because we have a major roadblock in the way of us beginning to learn service. The major, or two roadblocks, the roadblocks that are in the way for us, number one, listen to how, what the mom is saying, listen to the brothers, listen to all that dialogue. Number one problem is what? We want power. We want power. No matter what it is, no matter what we talk about, we want power. We want to believe that power is security. Well, Jesus had plenty of power. From the looks of the cross, was that, was that really security for him? The other, thing, the other thing we have going on is the opposite of power would be fear. If you take our power away, if you take our power away, if you take the way we want to do things away, if you take our sense of control away, doesn't that make us afraid? Isn't it fear that's going to become pervasive for us? What always causes a mess for us in relationships, at work, with our families, with our children, with our parents, with our in-laws, what always causes a mess boils down to two features. Number one, power. And number two, the fear of the loss of power. So you have Jesus telling these guys, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna ask you to make these sacrifices. I'm gonna ask you to drink this cup. And the cup represents, you know, the cup that, the cup that Jesus is gonna drink for the love of the world. And in that cup is all the brokenness in the world, all the pain in the world, all the, all the hard stuff in the world is all in that cup. Jesus is like, I'm gonna drink that cup. But you're gonna, you're gonna find your way, if you're gonna follow me, you're gonna find your way to also drinking that cup because you're gonna learn, if you're gonna follow me, you're gonna learn how to serve. When you drink that cup, it's gonna be a lot harder than you think. That's what Jesus is saying. What's in it? What's in the cup is us learning how to share in the healing in our corner, whatever it is, of the world. So you have a, a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife and you know they're in a typical, they get into this typical power conversation. I've had it with you, if you don't do this, if this is, if you ever do this again, I swear I'm gonna leave you. If you ever do this again, we say to our kids, you're grounded. It's like, it's like my, but that, that middle kid of my sisters, he would almost welcome it. You know, like, it's like, what do you do when that, what do you do when you ground somebody and they kind of like enjoy it almost? You gotta have another way. It's, uh, it's harder than you think to drink this cup that Jesus is talking about because you gotta find what it's like to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You gotta figure out what it's like to start to serve people that maybe aren't gonna be able to return anything whatsoever. What's in the cup really is, is the healing that we're gonna bring about through our lives and our service in our little corner of the world, whatever that is. So maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you take two hours out a week and maybe you're a dad and maybe you go to, um, maybe you go to your kid's school and maybe the job that you're gonna have is you're being asked to spend some time with kids that like nobody else wants to spend time with, right? And so that kid is like discipline problem, behavior problem, all of that. And so maybe they're gonna, maybe the school's gonna offer some kind of a peer-to-peer -peer support thing. And they're gonna ask you to do it. And you're gonna take your two hours worth of training. And you're gonna start to try to do that. And you're gonna be looking at this kid from across the table. And um, you're gonna get yes, no answers for 20 minutes. It's gonna be excruciatingly difficult. You're not gonna really know what's up. And you're gonna have Jesus going, just keep serving. Because by being there, you're serving. And you're gonna find out 
that you didn't say anything for the whole semester. You said nothing extraordinary whatsoever. You did nothing extraordinary whatsoever. But what are you gonna find out? Two years later, you're gonna find out from that kid that he talks about you, probably can't remember your name, he talks about you as being the person that listened to him, maybe for the first time. And all you did was listen. You didn't offer any advice, you didn't really have any direction. You felt overwhelmed for those whole six sessions or whatever. You felt like you got nothing accomplished whatsoever. And that's what he is gonna tell you or somebody in his family. You're gonna be like, I, I, never, I never thought I had that effect. It's like, that's the point. That's really the point of service, isn't it? It's not so much that, we, what are we gonna get out of it? Are we gonna see results? Because all of us would be involved in service if we thought we could see a result in front of our little face. If we could be satisfied by spending that hour for six weeks. We would all, we'd pretty much all sign up. We like, we like that gratification. But what about gratitude? What if you get to a place of going, I, I'm just grateful, I am literally grateful that I got to spend that hour, whether I accomplish anything or not, with that kid. We're gonna share in healing, this is what Jesus is saying, we're gonna to get to share in healing in our little corner of the world. Well, what is that? What's your corner of the world? And what healing is really available? There's a, it's, I think what we're talking about here in this piece of scripture is the great, what I guess I would call, it's a great servant leveler, right? Like you walk around and you wanna believe you got, you got this great job, you got this going on, you got that going on, you're a very important person. You're a very important person until you spend time with that kid that I've been talking about. Right then you walk away from that half an hour, you don't feel important at all. <laughs> you feel like you had nothing to say. You feel like you had no words of wisdom. You feel like you, feel like you didn't get anything done at all. And God's going, yeah, here's what you did. You showed up. You showed up. That is what you did. You showed up and that kid was starting to trust you because you showed up. That's a servant leveler. It's not what we're gonna get out of it. It's what we're gonna learn about ourselves. And it's about how we're gonna be able to offer Jesus, whether we know it or not, to people that we meet. What kind of gets in the way of that kind of an opportunity? Well, several things. Number one, I'm gonna ask this question. If you were to, if you were to write this, the answer to this down, what would it be, do you think? What are you right now a slave to? What are you right now a slave to? Is it some kind of insecurity you have? Is it a feeling of being treated unfairly? Maybe true. Is it a feeling that people don't understand you? Maybe true. Is it a feeling of, I don't feel like I'm accomplishing anything? Maybe true. What are you a slave to right now? Number two, what's dominating your thoughts and your actions? More often than not, more often than not, it's really about fear and control, isn't it? It's really about, I fear what I cannot control, that's true. I fear what I believe I'm losing control over, that's true. Whether it's a relationship, my work or whatever, I, my health, my health maybe, whatever. I fear what I might be losing control over. And I fear what I do not know. I fear what I do not know. Maybe that's the greatest fear that there is. Do I really know? I don't, I don't know what my life's gonna bring me. I don't know what it's gonna look like five years from now. I don't know. I fear what I do not know. The thing is, what we fear is gonna have great power over us. We can literally get swallowed up in ourselves, sitting right here. We can also literally get swallowed up in our own personal pain. And one of the hardest things we could ever do is just focus and obsess about our individual private pain. Am I sharing it with anybody? I'm not. Am I sharing it with God even? I'm not. Am I sharing it with my friend? I'm not. Is it getting any better? It's not. 
it's taken me away from my opportunity to be able to maybe sit with a kid like I was talking about and simply be a servant to him and care for him. There's other people we can be serving in our lives too, but like the thing is, what we believe we have power over, what we believe we have power over can and will ultimately become our fear. You know, I, I make a million dollars, right? I make a million dollars, I put a million dollars in the bank. I can begin to invest that million dollars in other people, other stuff, healing other people, helping other people to experience healing like that, or I can like kind of look at it every day, look at what's up, what's, I mean like, the stock market deal, man, it will just wreck you emotionally. Like, I, I, my mother-in-law just watches, she gets up and looks at the stock market three times a day. I'm like, you gotta stop because the market is volatile in a matter of hours. Stop looking at it, look at it once a week. Look at it once a month. It's not gonna change because of you. We can get so swallowed up, so, so taken with ourselves. That's as far as we get. Our personal pain is as far as we get. It's as far as we get. You know, like recovery models, I think take you to a very good place because somewhere along the way, recovery kind of teaches you, you know, you, you keep working on your cell, you keep working on your recovery, you keep working on your life plan, you keep working on, you know, what's, what's going on in your life, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or something else, doesn't matter. And somewhere along the way, Someone's gonna say to you, man, have you, have you ever like, have you ever thought about like helping somebody else? And the gratitude factor becomes very important to your spiritual and mental and physical health, amen? Giving back matters, it just matters because we're no longer being swallowed alive by our pain. What we believe we have power over really does eventually become our greatest fear because we're afraid we're gonna lose it, that's why. Without the heart of the servant, what Jesus is talking about, without the heart of the servant that's willing to risk for somebody else, that's willing to experience gratitude that shows up by man, I am grateful for what God is giving to me. I am grateful the way that Jesus has impacted me and it's gonna make me want to give myself away directly to somebody else, at least one other person. Doesn't have to be anything important. Nobody really has to know. I might feel like I'm not getting anything accomplished. I mean, I've felt that way a million times. A million times. Like, what, what am I really getting done here? I find out two years later, someone's talking to me, man, you really made a difference. It's like, I did? That surprise is God. That surprise where someone starts talking to you about something that you said, you can't remember that to save your life. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. That's you being released from your fear of trying to have control over stuff, amen? Trying to have control, there's eight million ways we try to have control over our marriages. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a way to get her to do what I want her to do. Get him to do what I want him to do, it's like man, we ought to be looking at a book like Andy Stanley wrote, you know, like um, he wrote this book on I marriage, it's called. And I mean, one of the things that's critical that comes out of that is, so aside from fidelity issues, aside from fidelity, a baseline, which defines marriage, what do I really, his question is, what do I really owe my spouse? What do I owe my wife? Nothing. What do I really owe my husband? Nothing. What the Holy Spirit is freeing me to do is to gift them A, B, C, D, or E, to gift him A, B, C, D, or E, to gift her A, B, C, D, or E. Maybe sometimes even when I'm afraid. There's this teacher I think a lot of, um, his name is Louis Giglio, senior pastor of this church, Passion City in um, DC and Atlanta. Well, I mean, I was shocked to find out like three or four years ago, and he wrote a book about it, but um, that Louis Giglio, who I think is like maybe one of the most accomplished speakers I've ever heard, Louis Giglio started talking about his deep, deep fear of what happened to him before he ever, he ever got on stage and delivered a message. He talks about, like, he threw up on the regular. 
Anxiety was overwhelming for him. You're like, man, I never saw any of that. Billy Graham talks about that a lot. Never saw it in Billy Graham. And you're like, yeah, um, that's being a servant. That's going, you know what, God? Whatever's going on with me, whatever I'm worrying about today, I'm willing to let you have it so that I can start to serve one other person maybe. The thing is this, without, without, the, without the heart of a servant, without, without the heart of servant power, which is exactly the opposite of the power that we would like to know about, without the heart of servant power, fear, fear is always gonna dominate because it's our vulnerability. It's true in relationships, it's true with our kids, it's true with our spouses, it's true with our parents, it's true with us. When I'm most afraid, I gotta ask a second question. Not just why am I afraid, but what am I afraid of? Am I afraid that I'm not gonna be able to control all of my circumstances? God's going, well, that'd be good. That'd be a good thing for you. Because would you let me, would you let me have it? Would you let me have that part of your life? What do you think it means for us to have a ransom life? It's very simple. To have a ransom life, it means that my life, my life, and sometimes you gotta say that to yourself, my life right now this morning has literally been a bought and paid for life. Bought with the blood of Jesus, bought with the shed blood of Jesus, and paid for with the life of Jesus. That's my life. That's the value that is on my life. What do you think the beauty is with being bought for a price? The beauty of being bought for a price is that you are basically in this room today as a priceless woman and as a priceless man. How do you live that ransomed life? How do you live that bought with a price life? How do you do it? How do you live that life of beauty? How do you become a servant? You become a servant when you exchange power for love. You become a servant when you exchange fear for security. Like, we don't have that on our own. We have that when we start spending time with Jesus. When you start, start spending time with Jesus, you see a whole different way to live. Lay your fear down, because you can do it, because Jesus will pick it up. Lay your fear down. Step into the arms of Jesus. You're safe in that place. You're loved in his arms. You're free in his arms. What a completely different life we would be living today if we just knew that. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, we just pray that you come into this room, that you convince us of exactly what we're talking about today. You convince us about that it's okay for us to let go. It's okay for us to let you have it, whatever it is. We can take our death grip off of it and we can give it to you. That's freedom. In your sweet name we pray, amen. Thanks so much.
here's where here's where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender sing it is where here's where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender